Welcome to today's webinar on component creation within the PADS Professional Workflow. Today we will talk about how to utilize the PADS Professional Library tools that are included with PADS Professional. Uh, so we'll also cover about how to use the cell editor to create some complex footprints. Uh, the cell editor, once again, uh, is different than some environments, especially if, if you're coming from the PADS layout space. We're going to just have a lot of different look and feel in the cell editor. And I just want to cover that to make sure everyone's comfortable on how to go ahead and utilize different pad stacks, utilize different uh, arrangements of pins, and how to create complex footprints utilizing that environment. I'll also show uh, some alternatives we have in the pads professional workflow to create complex symbols, footprints, and just complex parts overall, um, other than actually manually drawing them. We'll, we'll talk about that as well. Before we hop directly into the webinar, I just want to give a quick background. If you're unfamiliar with Oasis Sales, uh, we have been a Mentor Graphics Premier distributor for over 18 years. And with that, we, br we bring to the table a lot of in EDA industry knowledge. Uh, we can help you out from your FPGA development to PCB design, manufacturing, and simulation. So we can really cover a lot of areas and if you have any questions on anything that we don't cover today, I really hope that you'll reach out to me and I can help you get to the correct contact or get you any more information that you need. Okay, so we are partnering with TriLogic during this webinar series. So uh, just like Oasis Sales, TriLogic is a premier mentor graphics, now a Siemens business distributor and has been for a very long time. So uh, Oasis Sales covers the Midwest territory of the United States, and likewise, TriLogic covers the east and northeast regions of the United States. So you can see below those services or those states that they service. So if you're in those states um, and you don't know who to contact in the TriLogic organization, again, please feel free to reach out to me, and I will definitely pass your information along to the correct contact there. Okay, so here is a good uh, just for visual representation of our respective territories. Again, you can see Oasis Sales in the Midwest and TriLogic in the Northeast. So hopefully you're at least familiar with those names if you're utilizing Mentor Graphics tools now. And if you're interested in what you see today and like to more, learn more, please feel free to reach out to me. This webinar is being recorded and I will post it on YouTube once we're finished. So both Oasis Sales as well as TriLogic have a YouTube channel filled with lots of good content on there. So if you like what you see and you'd like to learn more about any facets of any mentor tool that we, we support, please feel free to head over to our YouTube channels and check out all the content there. Uh, after the webinar, we'll be sending a follow-up email with links to the archived version of this webinar, as well as links to a bunch of different goodies, including these uh, YouTube channels as well. So uh, you can click on those or just kind of search for it on YouTube. Here's my contact information. Please feel free to jot that down. Maybe take a quick screenshot of that. And we, uh, you can always reach out to me with questions big or small, and I can either uh, support you easily or point you to the correct person with that. Okay, so I do have everyone muted today, and we do have quite a large uh, audience, so I'm probably not going to be able to get to most of the questions today, but if you do have questions, please put those in the chat box. Uh, you should hopefully see that in the GoToMeeting dialog box. I'll see those once you ask them, and if it's relevant to what we talk about and I can easily discuss about that, I will definitely touch on your questions. Otherwise, I'll follow up with you in the next few days uh, with some more info on your question. Okay, uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hop into the webinar today talking about component creation in the patch professional workflow. Okay, so uh, if you're unfamiliar totally with Mentor Graphics, uh, they do have solutions for your entire electronics flow design. Okay, so uh, today we're going to be talking about PADS Professional, but as you'll see on your screen currently, we do support our four different mainstream tools in the Mentor Graphics workspace. And those are Expedition, which is an enterprise PCB design tool that's really good for supporting large organizations spread across 
uh, a country or multiple countries allows you to have a lot of data management capabilities in a very high-end layout environment. PADS has been around for a very long time. I'm sure most of you at least have heard of PADS in the past, maybe even used it. And what that is, it's more of a project-based or desktop-based PCB design tool that's uh, very simple to use, as, but yet still is very powerful, and you can do some quite some pretty complex designs with the PADS layout tool. So PADS Professional, if you're unfamiliar where that falls in, it it's, falls directly in between PADS and Expedition. So it, it utilizes Expedition technology for the layout tool, uh, but it still tries to retain its easy to use and easy to set up environment that PADS has had for a long time. On the flip side of that, uh, instead of the actual PCB design, we do offer PCB simulation and analysis tools in the form of hyperlinks. So hyperlinks is a family of tools that can do signal integrity checks, EMI checks, uh, power integrity simulation as well. So it can make sure that you're not gonna have to do any re-spins on your designs or have any major issues down the road. So uh, if you haven't heard of hyperlinks, I can be more than happy to discuss that with you later as well. And then on the manufacturing and assembly side, we do have the Valor family of tools. These provide DFM checks on your routed board just to make sure that you're going to have a high yield during production. Okay. I like to show this slide off just why is it important to build solid components, uh, very correct library parts. Why is that important? As we can see, the, the main takeaway from this slide that I want to highlight is that red line that's just increasing in an exponential fashion almost. That is just showing the average leads per square inch on printed circuit boards. So you can see back in 1994, uh, we had about 50 leads per square inch. Now it's all the way up uh, over 350 leads per square inch. So it's just increasing complexity of components themselves. We know that packages are getting smaller, footprints are getting more difficult to create. So I hope to alleviate some of those fears of creating your own components and making sure that they're going to be valid and usable footprints on your layout. Okay. So the PADS professional library structure. This is kind of a, a different library structure. Again, if you're moving from the PADS world into PADS professional, it is just a slightly different way to think about how the library is handled. Okay. So, um, it is called a central library, and why it's called a central library is it stores all of your data, symbol, cell, part data, even your 3D data, which I'm not going to be talking about today, but it stores it all in this one central library location. And why this is important is we can actually store this on a network and have all of your designers, your users in multiple locations pointing to that one central library, allowing you or the librarian to create those correct parts and then allow anyone else to use those parts once they're in that central library location. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. That's totally fine. I just do want to remind everyone, if you guys have questions throughout the webinar, please enter those into the chat box and I'll be happy to answer those. Okay, so how do we access this PADS library tool? So you'll see on that screenshot on the right-hand side of my screen there, is a the pads library tools and this is a very powerful environment that allows us to access all of that data that the central library holds and what's nice about this tool is we can access this pads library tools environment from the schematic from the layout or standalone without going in through the schematic or layout tool okay so uh, that was a new functionality that was just released so if you're not familiar that you can open it with a standalone version uh, that is in the newest version of the tool. Okay, so just a little bit more about PADS Pro Library Tools. I don't want to talk too much about uh, on these slides. I want to hop in the tools and make sure we can cover as much as we can during our time. But I just want to talk about some useful functionality within the PADS Library Tools. Um, I see a good question from Michael. I see, is the data in the central library provided by Mentor? That's a great question, and um, I can definitely talk about that once we end this slideshow here. But there are, there is a starter central library that is included with PADS Professional. Okay, so it's a pretty good library to get you started out and at least running with the tool. And then also there's a free 
library for, available for download called the ODA or Optimum Design Associates Pads Professional Library that includes about 11,000 parts in there for you to start out with. Okay, so you don't have to start off with a blank central library. There are starting blocks for you. Of course, we don't have any libraries with 10 million parts. Unfortunately, that would be nice, but at least we give you a starting block and hopefully we can build the foundation of building correct by construction parts here today so you can feel uh, confident in going off and creating your own components. So just some useful functionality in the PADS Pro library tools that I wanted to highlight uh, before we get into the component creation is library services is a very powerful uh, way to exchange data between central libraries. So say you're working with multiple central libraries and you want to exchange data very easily. There's a functionality called library services where you can point to a different central library or even just a .pcb file that you've got from someone but you don't have the library associated with it we're able to suck in all of that data uh, and put it into our current existing central library. Another new functionality that was released uh, in the last few releases of PADS Pro is library verification. We can start this verification and it looks through all of your library data and allows you to see any errors or incompleteness of objects in your central library. So it's pretty easy to use and just gives you a nice sanity check to make sure that you don't have any incomplete parts or just random objects that aren't being utilized anywhere. And the last thing I like to talk about in the PADS Pro library tools is uh, the layout template editor. So the layout template editor allows us to create templates for PCBs, panels, if you're doing any panel design, or drawings if you're using the drawing editor in the PADS Pro workspace. Uh, so we create the templates in the central library tools, and then we can utilize those in our layout, or in our drawings, or in our panel designs. Okay, so I, I, I wanted to break down the part creation process in four simple steps. And I, I came up with this, it was, first one, we're going to have to create the necessary pad stacks. Okay, so this is a, a necessary evil that we have to do in order to go ahead and actually start creating footprints in our central library. And those, the pad stacks uh, consist of the pins, pads, or holes, or maybe even custom pad shapes that we want to create that we are able to utilize in our footprint. So we just have to define those to make them usable as pins in the cell editor. Next, we can actually go ahead and create the symbol in our central library. And there's a few different ways that we can do that. And I'll talk about both when we actually hop into the tool. And that is utilizing the symbol wizard, which kind of brings in your data and allows you to create a part uh, very quickly. It kind of creates the symbol for you automatically. Or the symbol editor, which is the uh, older method where you just draw it by hand, essentially. And both are very easy to do in the PADS Pro library tools. Uh, then the third step is how we create cells. Okay, so the cell editor or the pads land pattern creator can both be accessed directly from the pads library tools and used to create cells fairly quickly. Finally, we're actually going to create the part. And what I mean by creating the part is actually marrying the symbol and the cell together to create a workable, usable part in our schematic and library. Uh, Phil, I see that you asked, will I show how to how to bring parametric data in from an enterprise PLM system and integrate it into the library? Unfortunately, I'm not going to be covering that today, uh, but I can definitely follow up with you and provide you some info on that. Okay, so hopping into creating a symbol. So like I said, we can either utilize the cell or the symbol editor where that's just a, you draw the symbol, you place the pins one by one or in an array functionality and allows you to just create the symbol like you have in every other schematic editor that you've used previously. Uh, an easier way and maybe a quicker way to create those symbols is actually utilizing the symbol editor. And, or I'm sorry, the symbol wizard. Uh, this allows us to easily create fractured symbols 
and we can actually copy and paste symbol data in from Excel. I've worked with a lot of customers that uh, first create their symbol information on Excel or spreadsheet or anything like that. And what we can do with that information, uh, we can actually just copy the pin name, the pin number, and what site it's on and paste it directly into the symbol wizard and it'll automatically create that symbol for us. Next, we're going to actually hop into creating the cell. And again, there's two different ways that we can do this. We can create a new cell in the cell editor, and this is a, an environment where we can place pins parametrically. We can place pins in a pattern-based way as well, and allows us to manipulate the grid that they're placed on, and we can draw the assembly outline and the manufacturing outline by hand around those pins, and enabling us to have a lot of control over how that package actually looks okay so it's really easy to take the data sheet from let's say digikey or whatever manufacturer you're working with and you can just look at all that parametric information and kind of utilize that in order to create your cell very easily also in the pads pro environment you can utilize the land pattern creator um, this is historically known as the IPC 7351 land pattern calculator or wizard. I've heard that as well. Um, that's just the tool now that has allowed us to really easily create common type cells and bring them into the central library. One way that I utilize this tool is I create a BGA, for example, um, and just bring that into the central library very quickly, very easily. Then if I need to make edits, for that cell, I will just edit that cell after it's been created in the pan, pan, land pattern creator and then uh, save that into the central library that way. That's a very easy way to create a BGA and manipulate it to our settings. All right, and then the final step that we are going to be taking today is creating parts. So again, like I said, creating parts is utilizing the pin mapping dialog box to marry the symbol to the cell. And as we'll see, you can kind of see in those screenshots that I took up there, is we have a symbol associated with this part as well as a cell and allows us to marry those two together by matching up pin number names um, and allowing them to automatically be defined. So within here, we can actually create fractured symbols, if anyone's familiar with that term, as in we have a symbol uh, in multiple representations. So say you're working with a large pin device and you want to break up that symbol that would be, let's say, a thousand pins into 10 smaller symbols of 100 pins each. That would be a very good example of a fractured symbol. And we can do that definition within here. Um, and I've got some good tech notes here. I think I've, on this next slide, I've got some useful links that I'll send out again after the webinar um, on how to create hetero parts. And those are called hetero parts just because heterogeneous for different types of symbols. And we are able to define those pretty easily. Okay. And then the last thing I'm going to be talking about today is part quest. And I'm not going to go too deep into the setup of this, but at least uh, talk about it, maybe take a quick peek at the website. What this is, it's a free service for mentor customers to download symbols, cells, and part data for DigiKey components. Okay. So really easy to go ahead and set up your design or your account on partquest.com, link it to your DigiKey account, link it to your SupportNet account or mentor account, and then look at components on the ParkQuest website and download those and bring those into our central library very, very easily. Okay, so as of right now, it's got about 360,000 parts last time I checked. And then uh, if you do not see a part that you want to download on ParkQuest, there is the ability to request that part to be made. Okay, so that's a kind of a new feature that's been rolled out in the last few months. It allows you to request a part to be made and a uh, mentor contractor will go ahead and create that part, the symbol and the cell for you and actually turn it around within uh, 24 hours, I think is their uh, guaranteed return time on those part requests. And so that can be a very powerful feature. Okay, 
I also see a question um, from Michael again. Is, is there a similar central library to the PAD standard and standard plus? Uh, there is. You can utilize a central library flow in PAD standard plus, uh, but not in PAD standard. And likewise, you can also use the starter libraries that Mentor includes in both of those flows. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and actually hop into the tools. Okay, so, uh, like I was saying, we can access the PAD library tools in, a, in multiple ways. Um, what I'm going to show is actually utilizing the standalone methodology of PADS library tools. And again, this is a functionality uh, that was just introduced in VX 2.4, which is the most current version. But you'll see I'm going to go into data management and PADS library tools. Okay. Likewise, if I actually use the start bar, Windows 10 makes it a little bit more difficult in the start menu. But if I go to PADS Professional, you can see that PADS library tools is right here in VX 2.4. If I click on that, that's going to go ahead and open up a blank PADS library tools. And within here, there's a couple of different functionalities that I can do. I can create a brand new central library if I would like. This will create a blank .lmc directory for all of your data to be held in. Or I can actually point to and open a central library. So I'm going to go ahead and just open this up. And this is a good segue into the starter libraries that we have within the PADS Pro Flow. Okay. So installed with PADS Professional, when you install it on your machine, is the PADS Professional Evaluation Guide. I always like to highlight this because not that many customers know about it unless uh, they figure it out somehow. But what this provides is seven lessons for PADS Professional. Okay, so it does a really good job. It has a PDF that walks you through all of these different lessons from part creation to schematic usage to layout. So I highly recommend people that are unfamiliar with this tool utilize this PADS Professional evaluation in order to get up to speed as quickly as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and navigate into the library and double click on the .lmc or just select it and hit open. It's going to open up our central library. And as you can see, as soon as I open that, we have a couple of different sections of note. Okay, so again, I've got parts, I've got cells, and I've got symbols. Under all of these different sections, I have my partitions. Partitions are essentially, you can think of them as almost separate libraries where you can just have an organization tree of your components. Okay, so in order to look at what's in these different comp these partitions, I can just expand that and actually look at a part. So you'll see a part, as soon as I expand that, I have an associated symbol and as an associated cell. If I single click on both of these, or either one, it's going to give me a preview of the symbol and the cell. Okay. Likewise, if I double click on the symbol, that will open up the symbol in the symbol editor. Okay, so I did see a question on how to open up the symbol editor from the PADS Pro Library Tools. That is one way to do it. I can just double click on a symbol name and it will open up that specific symbol in the symbol editor. Or I can click on this icon right here, uh, the symbol editor. You can kind of see there's a pencil over uh, an op amp or a NAND gate, it may be, uh, but that opens up the symbol editor for you. So the functionality that I was talking about that I really like within the PADS library tools, if I go tools, library services, that will open up my library services dialog box. Within here, again, I can actually point to a PCB file. If I, um, or a central library. So you'll see I'm pointing to a different central library and I want to pull in any of the cell data, I can just select it and import it into my currently working central library. All right, so again, going back to what I 
was talking about in the presentation, those four steps to part creation. So let's go ahead and tackle that first part, which was create your pad stacks. Okay. So in order to open up the pad stack editor, I'm going to go tools, pad stack editor, or you can click on this icon here in the pad stack editor. Okay, so this opens up the pad stack editor. And what a pad stack is, is it's a layer definition defined by the pads that you have created in your library. Okay, so again, the central library uh, that you should be starting with is uh, the mentor starter library, and it will include all of these different pads. So you see, we can have we have a lot of these normal standard size pads. Very easy to kind of understand. We can change what that pad looks like if we want, very quickly, very easily, and adjust that. So uh, just to make sure everyone knows how to create new pads if they need to, I can filter within here if I want to create a new round pad. I'm going to go ahead and again filter to round and create a new one. I just have to hit on new pad and start typing in my parametric information uh, here. So one thing to take note of is in the central library, you can have specific design units on every, spe every item in the central library. So you can change the units on those different items if you want to design in millimeters or thousands or inches or even micro, microns, you can do that directly within here. So if I want to create a new uh, round, let's go ahead and create a 115 pad. It'll show us what that pad looks like. Okay. I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this Kyle's pad just so we're able to find it fairly easily. And that allows us to now create a pad stack so again the pad is going to be a single layer definition of what that pad looks like the pad stack actually defines what it looks like through all layers aka a stack of pads throughout your layers okay so again within here i can create or filter on a specific type of pin if i want okay I can again just click on something and it will give me a preview. If I click on the top mount solder mask, it'll give me a preview of what that pad looks like on that top mount solder mask. Okay. Um, before I get too far in there, we do have the ability to create custom pads. So you'll see here, these are my options for pads one at a time. Okay. If I want to create custom pads, I can go to the custom pads and drill symbols here and actually go ahead and start creating uh, polygons that we can use as pads in our cells. So I'm going to go ahead and create an oblong polygon pad, we'll call it. Okay. So as soon as I've done that, I can just start drawing a polygon. And again, you'll, you can take note of units that we have in the bottom right hand side. Okay. So now that I've created this custom pad shape, I'm actually going to be able to use it in a pad stack, which can be very powerful uh, for the use of thermal or ground slugs. Bob, uh, can you still associate shapes with pads and the combined shape shows up in the solder slash paste mask? Yes, that is exactly correct. All right, so I've created my oblong polygon pad, and now I'm going to create a new pad stack directly for that. Okay, so I'm going to just call this polygon, and I can start defining what that's going to look like. Okay, so you'll see I have to select my pad that I want to use on this layer, and I'm going to select the oblong polygon pad. This will allow me to set it for a top mount, a bottom mount. So this specifies what pad this pad stack is going to use depending on if the part that uses it is mounted on the top side of your board 
or if it's pushed to the bottom. So you can have different pads depending on if the component is on the top or the bottom of your board. Okay. And then I can select all four of these solder masks, for example, and hit the left arrow there, and I'm just going to create that top mount solder mask for us correctly as well. Okay, so that's creating uh, pad stacks. It is fairly simple. Um, it, I understand that these dialog boxes can be a little bit intimidating, um, but if you ever have an issue with a certain dialog box in all of the pads professional flow, whether it's in the schematic, the layout, the library, or even constraints, if I just go to help contents, this will actually open up the HTML documentation directly to the dialog box that you're in. Okay, so if I'm confused on how to do something all the time, I click on the help icon that's either on the dialog box or go to that help section, and it'll open up this nice, easy to work with documentation specific for that dialog box that you're working with. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit save since I have edited what this pad stacks looks like, and I'll hit exit there. Okay, so we've done our first part of part creation, which is creating the pad stacks. Okay, we've even created a custom shape pad pad stack, so we're, on, we're in good shape right now. Next that we wanna do, I'm gonna go ahead and actually create a cell. Okay, so um, if I want, I'm gonna, again, I've got a partition here named Kyle underscore cell. And if you wanna create new partitions in the central library, again, very easy. I can just right click on there and hit new partition. I can also do a find, which I can actually search through uh, this section of the central library and look for any components that have that name that we're looking for. So this allows us to hopefully find information that you're looking for. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hit right click on my partition called Kyle's cell. And within here, I can hit new cell or the pads land pattern creator. Okay, so first, just to show how easy this is, I'm going to use the pads land pattern creator. And this will open up that IPC 7351 calculator. Um, and allows us to start working with this. Okay, so I know this is kind of confusing to work with as well, but if I click on the calculate button here, I am able to start looking at my different types of footprints that I can create with this tool. So I'm gonna click on the SMD calculator, and this is all of the different options that I have. Okay, so there's quite a few in here, um, but if I just want a quick one, quick one at random, like I was saying, uh, we can do a BGA, and then go ahead and start editing it itself. So once I hit OK, this is a fairly straightforward entryway system to just look at the data sheet and plug in that information that you see on the data sheet for your components uh, to make this a usable component. Okay, so uh, for example, I can change the ball type. I can actually change the ball size and we should see the reflection uh, update here. Okay, so just to make this a little bit more interesting, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, create this as a 0.7 pitch just to make it a little bit tighter of a component. Okay, so once I've done this, I can hit OK, and you'll see that a green light turns on in the top left corner of this dialog box, okay? So as soon as that green is good, that means this footprint's ready to go and be pushed back into that central library, okay? So right here, I can click on wizard. What this will do is I can actually start adding uh, attributes or properties to this exact cell, okay? So this will be a cell level property, um, which is fine to use. And then I have the ability to save this to the central library, okay? So you'll see that it is checked right now. And I, all I'm gonna do here is say create and close. This will create that cell, push it into the central library and close the IPC 7351 land pattern calculator. Wow. Okay, so I'm gonna hit a, yeah. 
I'm going to hit refresh here to make sure I can actually see that cell and we'll see that it popped up here. Okay, so that's the cell I just created. Again, if I want, I can copy this. Um, if I right click on a cell, I can copy it. I can move it to a different partition after you've gone ahead and created it and make sure it's a verified part. I can push this into a different central library partition if I would like. Um, just for to see what it looks like in the cell editor, I'm going to double click on the cell and it's going to open it up in the cell editor and allow us to start making changes to it. Okay, so this is the cell that we just created in that land pattern creator and pushed it into our central library. Okay, so this is the cell editor environment. Um, it is exactly like the Pads Pro layout environment. About, across the bottom of the screen, you're going to see those function keys, and these function keys are all context sensitive. So you'll see as soon as I click on something, those function keys are going to change. And it, uh, Bob, cell is uh, synonymous with a decal. That is correct. Um, so here, within here, I can take a look at a few different things. So you'll see if I go uh, place pin, for example, I bring up my pin dialog box. Okay. Um, here, I can actually do a lot of things that will allow me to kind of play around with this. So for this pin A1, for example, I can go ahead and click on it and just change this to a different type of pad stack. Okay, so very easy to do. What I can also do, you'll see on the left-hand column, P, that means that these particular pins have all been placed. Okay, so I can click on that and hit unplace, and we'll see that it switched from a P as placed to U as unplaced. Now, if I want to replace this pin, I can click on place, and it'll allow me to plop it down right there. I guess that pad stack's really not that different, so let me change it to uh, something a little bit different. Polypad. I'm going to unplace it first, and now it's changed to pad oblong. Now I'll place it, and you'll see that that has changed that pad look. Okay, so it wouldn't do it on the fly just because it was going to give us a DRC violation because uh, it would have collided with those other pins. But this is a good way to understand that we can first use that pad land pattern creator to go ahead and create the cell for us, and then we can go in and manually edit it to make the changes necessary. Okay. So this is a good way to go ahead and get started. Um, now I'm actually going to try and create a cell from scratch. So uh, I did make a change. I'm going to say the current cell has been modified. Do you want to save the changes? I'm going to hit yes. Uh, and now we should hopefully see these changes reflected in the cell preview if I click on it again. Okay. So just like that, we can see that this cell has changed that first pin from round to oblong uh, just because we made it on the fly. So again, I really think it's a good idea to maybe use that wizard, that calculator, to first create complex parts like this and then go in and start editing them manually. Okay. Uh, what I can do now is I'm going to go ahead and create a new cell. Again, if I right click on new cell, I can uh, create a new cell of my name. Okay, so this creates the new cell dialog box. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new cell with 49 pins. You can specify the layers while editing the cell. I usually recommend just uh, having two layers on there. It will uh, enlarge itself so you can work with a through hole design on an eight layer board, on a 12 layer board. It, it doesn't matter. It will understand how to make that cell usable in whatever layer design you're working with. I'm going to choose package group as a BGA, uh, surface type mount because we already know that a BGA can really only be surface mount these days. Okay, so once I hit next, this is just going to open that cell editor once again. Um, and looking at the questions again, yes. Bob, does this change you just did ripple up to the PCB file? That's a great question. Um, I wish I could 
show you how that's done, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do that in this time. Uh, but yes, that can, in fact, ripple up to the PCB if you do a forward annotation um, and update cells and pad stacks with deleting all of your local library data to be replaced with newer central library data. So that's a, that's a checkbox that you can do in the uh, project integration dialog that'll allow you to set that. Okay, so uh, this again brings open our cell editor. So there's a couple of different things that we can do within here. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about is parameter place. This allows us to specify the number of columns and rows and the spacing between and the numbering system that the pins uses. We can also utilize uh, a, diff a pattern place that allows us all to kind of look at these different BGA parameters. Okay, what's nice about this is it will automatically draw the uh, assembly outline and silkscreen outline. So um, this is a really easy way to go ahead and create this. And I've got 49 pins, so I'm gonna create uh, four, 12 columns with four rows. First, I'm gonna change all of my pins I can change the pad stacks all at once by group selecting them with the shift key, hitting one of the drop downs, and I'm gonna go ahead and use this round pad, okay? If I have the parameters set here, I can just hit place and it's automatically gonna create that for me, okay? So very easy to use that type of methodology. That's just a parameter place, a pattern place that we can have. I'm going to hit a control Z and get back out of that dialog box. If you don't know where that pin dialog box that I was just working with went, you can always go place pin. Okay, so this will bring open that pin dialog box once again. And like I was saying before, this is a good example. If I'm if I'm confused on how to use this dialog box, I don't I don't understand it. Again, there's that help icon right there that will open up the cell editor dialog box. Uh, HTML documentation. Okay, so this is the place pins dialog box, excuse me. But anywhere that you see that little uh, dictionary with a help question mark, click on that and it'll give you some really good information. Okay, I know earlier I saw a question about setting the grid in the cell editor and how to make sure that I'm placing pins on a grid. It's a great question because it's really important. So um, if you have the editor control opened up, let's say I don't have that open. I can go to Setup Editor Control. And this will open up the Editor Control, and you'll see we have a Route and a Grids tab. Okay, the, the Grids tab allows me to go ahead and type in what I want my grid for my pins to be. I'm gonna set this as a seven, just because I have a seven mil pitch for this component. Okay, so as soon as I set that, these pins are all gonna be seven by seven, essentially. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and make this a couple of different uh, rows and stuff. First, I'm gonna select pins one through 24, and we'll utilize that round pad. I'm gonna make 12 columns, seven by seven spacing, two rows, seven spacing again. Here, now I can click on the pin sequence, and this will actually affect the numbering of how these pins are placed, okay? So you'll see pin one is at the top left, it goes all the way to the right, and then the numbering will uh, begin on the second column going from lowest to highest, left to right. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit place. Um, this said I had not selected a pin sequence yet, so I just need to click on that pin sequence, sequence one more time and hit place. Okay, so you can kind of see, hopefully you can see on all your ends, that these pins are all following that grid. Okay, so you can kind of see the grid settings in the cell editor, they're white little dots, and you can see that these pins are following directly on them because I've got that route grid set as well as that parameter place set um, in the pin dialog box. So I'm gonna go ahead and click those, and again, I'm gonna take note that we have the P for all of those placed pins, and the U for all of those unplaced pins, so I know what I need to do with the rest of these. I'm gonna go ahead and hit place. And again, I can leave space because I wanna put 
my 49th pin, and I'm going to change this to uh, that wacky looking irregular pad that I uh, made before. Um, I actually don't think that was the one. I think it was a polygon pad. So I'm going to place that, and we can see that it definitely looks like that polygon pad for us. Okay. So that's an easy way that we can utilize a, an irregular irregular pad shape to uh, associate copper to. Okay. We can also draw copper as well directly within here, conductive shapes. You can draw those as thermal pads and connect those to pins so they will be electrically connected. That's two different ways that we can utilize uh, ground pins or thermal slugs on your cells. Okay, so if I wanna change this just a little bit. And you'll see these ref des, so one, um, is on the mount side. You can see anytime I select anything in the cell editor, I want you to take a look at the bottom of the screen right there. That tells you just a little bit more information about that particular item that I'm selecting. Or if I double click on it, we will see the properties dialog box pop open. Okay, so if I double click on the orange ref des, it's going to open up my properties and show that this is the assembly ref des. With this properties window open, I can click on something else and you'll see that the white one is the silkscreen reference designator. Okay, so one for the assembly, one for the silkscreen. And uh, if you have company standards on where you set those, or if you're following IPC standards, uh, you can move and drag and drop these. Okay, so uh, I know this isn't the most the best looking footprint we have so far, but I'm gonna go ahead and start drawing a placement outline. So I'm gonna click on this dialog here or this icon here for placing and uh, placing a placement outline, okay? So what I can do is as soon as I click on that, I'm gonna hit the F9 function key for adding a rectangle. Okay, so I can draw my placement outline as much as I'd like. We do have measurement capabilities within here that you're able to do. Uh, I see a question from Brian, alphanumeric pin numbers. Yes, PADS Professional supports that. Uh, we just have to type that into that pin dialog box and those will be named as so. So let's just take a quick look back at that and you'll see that these are just all pin numbers. You're right, um, but I can change that to like an A2, for example, and that will be totally fine. Okay, um, we can also place a silk screen outline if you wish, um, an assembly outline as well. I can actually do uh, functionality, I can copy this other assembly outline. I'm just gonna go ahead, right click and hit copy. And I'm gonna paste it right there. So now we will see that we have a placement outline and two placement outlines right now, but I can quickly change this to an assembly outline. Again, using that properties dialog box, I can just select, change this from placement outline to assembly outline, and we'll notice that the color changes from blue to green. Okay. All right, so once we have our footprint created, um, I'm gonna go ahead and exit from here. The last thing I do wanna say is we do have the ability to import DXF. If you're wanting to bring that in as a cell for whatever reason, you can import DXF into the cell editor and utilize uh, graphics in your cells as well. I'm gonna hit save and go file, exit graphics. Look. I'm on mute. Yeah, it's like, that's oh, not just a time to populate or something. No, I think they sent me back to my default. They, they created a, a different instance of me yesterday. They sent me back to my default one. But now I'm at least receiving emails and able Sorry, to- Sorry, everyone, I'm trying to uh, 
so, I need this person. Okay, that should be better. Sorry about that. Okay, so once we've exited that cell editor, there we have our cell. Okay, so again, we've got that irregular pad in the center for uh, our ground slug, and we can go ahead and actually use this in a part definition now. Okay, so the next step in our part creation is to create a symbol. So again, just like creating a cell, I can use my different partitions here and right click on my partition. Okay, so again, we'll see a couple of different options that we have. We can just create a new symbol and that will open up the symbol editor that allows us to just hand draw the symbol and place the pins. Uh, what I wanted to show today, just because I think uh, that's fairly straightforward, is we can use the symbol wizard. And what I can do here is I can call this Kyle underscore symbol. And I guess I already have a symbol with that name. So I'm going to go ahead and create this um, new symbol. Okay, so this opens up the symbol wizard dialog box. And what we can do within here, uh, the first page is asking what type of symbol is this going to be? A module, as in just a schematic symbol, or a composite symbol, and that making a hierarchical symbol for us. So if you're not familiar with hierarchical design, the X designer has the ability to use blocks, which you can push into, and the symbol wizard can create those very easily. Okay. Um, next, it's going to ask me if I want to fracture this symbol into smaller size symbols, and I can click on yes to fracture this symbol. That means we're going to create two symbols in one go. Okay. I'm going to hit next, and this is going to allow me to adjust my symbol parameters for my pin settings, so I can actually uh, adjust these. And you'll see, as soon as I adjust the pin spacing, for example, it's going to uh, kind of automatically reflect that in that preview. Here, we can actually add uh, symbol level properties to this symbol. Um, and if you'd like to see what types of properties we can see that are used in this, I can click on property glossary and it will again open up that HTML documentation for us and tell us all of those different symbols that we can use. All right, symbol properties, excuse me. Okay, so this actually opens us up with the where we want to enter in our pin numbers. Okay, so what we can do within here is I can uh, just start naming this. I'm going to go ahead and do some alphanumeric uh, like was requested and um, go ahead and looking at pin names and pin numbers. Okay, so as soon as I start creating this, you'll see that it automatically reflects that on that symbol editor there. Okay, um, this is a good place where I've worked with customers that actually create spreadsheets based on their symbols. Okay, so this is a, a good way to start thinking about how you can create symbols in a more intelligent fashion. I can actually create my pin labels, my numbers, and my what type and side that I want to have these pins on. So I'm going to just go ahead and select this information, do a control C for copying that information, and hop back into the library tool. Now I'm just going to select on this first top left cell under pin name, I'm just do a control V. Okay, so that's pasting all of that information directly in to the symbol wizard dialog box. So you'll see that that was created automatically. Uh, this last one didn't get the fracture name populated correctly, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Click off that cell, and you can see that we have our power pin defined at the top. Okay. So now I'm going to click on the new icon. This is going to allow me to uh, create a new symbol 
three, and this is going to be our next fracture of that symbol. So you'll see back in that spreadsheet, I think I have uh, 49 pins again, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, just once again select that information I need. Control C, Control V. And we basically just like that have created this symbol. Um, I am going to change that power back up to be on the top of that symbol. Okay, so now we've got new symbol two and new symbol three. Uh, new symbol three has a few more pins on it, as you can see. Um, and that's going to go ahead and create those symbols for us. All right, so the last part of part creation is how to actually create the part. Okay. And this can be a difficult part of the process just because the pin mapping dialog box uh, can be a little bit confusing if you're trying to create a very complex part. Okay, and I know we're uh, reaching about here about an hour, so I'm gonna try and wrap it up soon. Uh, but we'll go through this. And like I said, if you have any uh, questions or want any more information in the future, uh, please let me know and uh, we can talk about that further. So uh, if I want to create a new part, all I got to do again on my central library here is right click on the partition I want to put it in and hit new part. This will allow me to create a new part. And this opens up the part editor dialog box. Here you can enter in some more uh, part level properties, and then you can add a description if you would. Um, I do see a question from Scott about pin numbers. Are they being required? Um, yes, I, I do believe that pin numbers are gonna be required on all of your cells because that's how they map up the cell to the pin numbers on the symbol. That's really what's happening there is they're matching up the pin numbers to make sure that everything's defined correctly so you don't have to match them one by one. So I don't think we can use a P pound like you are showing in your example. Okay, so here is where I can actually go ahead and start assigning a cell and a symbol to this part. Okay, so first for a symbol, I'm gonna go ahead and look at my different symbols. So this shows us all of my symbols that I have in my different symbol partitions. Okay, so I can filter on a particular partition that I wanna look at. And we'll go ahead and use this. So as soon as I'm creating this new or importing this new symbol, I want to make sure that I am including both the pin properties and pin number mapping. So the pin number mapping will allow us to automatically map the pin numbers from the symbol to the cell so we don't have to do any uh, other information. So I'm gonna type in number of slots in the component. And what this is defining is the number of, uh, essentially the number of symbols that you're going to be using for that part. So right now we're just gonna create this first slotted component. and that automatically pulls in all of those pin number information. Okay, so now I can import the cell and look at my different cells that I want to bring in for this part. All right, so the logical tab shows us uh, the actual logical connections uh, for the symbol compared to the cell. So logical as in functionality wise. Physical is actually going to show me the physical pin number to the actual pin number on the cell here. So for example, I can click on, since we don't have the same pin numbers, you'll see we have alphanumeric in the symbol I selected and numeric strictly on the cell I selected. So here, as soon as I enter in one, you'll see that that pin number has been released or uh, removed from the selection list. Okay, so that's one easy way to go ahead and start creating your parts that way. I'm gonna actually go ahead and take a look at a part that's already been completed. 
And as you can see, this part has a 250 or 264 symbol and a 264 cell, just like that. So if I right click on this part and hit edit, this will open up that part editor one more time. This is where we are going to change the reference, des reference designator prefix. Uh, that'll allow you to specify what you want this to be packaged as and have the reference designator. In this case, it'll be a U7, for example, once it's packaged. Okay. So in here, in the pin mapping, you can see that this has already been defined for the slot or the symbol pins compared to the actual physical pins on the right-hand column. So this has been defined correctly. And now once I hit symbol slash cell preview, it just allows us to see the symbol and the cell that's defined there. All right, um, and the last thing I wanna show before we end our session today is again, just partquest.com. Uh, this is a really great resource. I've worked with customers on setting this up, and as soon as they're set up and understand how to work with this tool, it's a great tool uh, to quickly build your library data. Okay, so I'm just gonna search for a component. And you can see that it has all of the parametric information directly from DigiKey and has a symbol and a footprint available for me to download. Okay, so all I have to do within there is download it and uh, import it into ParkQuest. I will provide a tech note on how to use this tool uh, and how to set it up correctly because it can be a little bit difficult to set up. If you wanna go ahead and try and get this working, the first thing I wanna make sure that you do is go to your profile and make sure that you set uh, pads professional as your default flow, okay? So you'll see default flow, that basically makes this tool give you a certain type of part format so you can import it into pads professional correctly. So that's the first thing that I want you to do and then go ahead and um, actually download the PartQuest integration utilities. So the download button is kind of hidden here, but you can download that PartQuest integration utilities for pads professional and then install that, and then you should uh, just make sure it's set up correctly and be good to go importing those into the PADS Professional Central Library. Okay. All right, with that, I'm, I know there was a lot of info today and I didn't get to everyone's uh, questions, but again, here's my contact information. Please feel free to jot that down. And again, I'll answer the questions that I didn't get to today and um, I will make sure that I follow up with you. And again, please feel free to reach out to me in the future if you have any questions or wanna know anything else about uh, the mentor graphics offering that Oasis Sales supports. Thank you for your time today. We'll be sending out uh, so an email blast most likely tomorrow with a link to the archive webinar, as well as uh, any, some more goodies on how to do correct part creation in the past professional flow. Okay, thank you again for attending. Have a great rest of your day.